experience. And so how exactly objects in themselves give rise to that um, phenomenal perspective um, is something that we can't get a theoretical explanation of. Okay. And I'm expressing that in order to talk about this one last passage here. And that is um, on 68 to 69. Um, very bottom of the page. So he says, the subjective impossibility of explaining freedom of the will is the same as the impossibility of detecting and making comprehensible an interest that a human being, a empirical human being, could take in moral laws. And even so, he actually does take, human beings do take an interest in them, the foundation of which we call moral feeling, which some have falsely proclaimed the standard of our moral judging, whereas it must rather be viewed as the subjective effect that the law exercises on the will, for which reason alone supplies the objective grounds. Okay, so we human beings, we human beings uh, can, in fact, be motivated by the moral law. We can take the requirements of reason themselves to be able to motivate us. And Kant's point here is that the, as it were, empirical, empirical manifestation of reason in us, let me say that again, the empirical manifestation in us of pure reason, of the categorical imperative, is a certain kind of sensation, a certain kind of feeling. Uh, maybe you want to call this colloquially conscience. So conscience, moral sense, is the way pure reason manifests itself in empirical beings like us, in beings that are not purely, ra purely rational, but have empirical desires as well. So how it is that uh, your reason can make itself felt in empirical beings like us, that's just the question that I was alluding to a moment ago, namely how something in itself can affect uh, empirical objects. That's a mystery concept. So how it is possible for something in the world of uh, objects in the intelligible world, to affect objects in the empirical world is something that we can't get a theoretical explanation of. However, it does, they do, and the manifestation of that in us is our moral sense. Now the key is, as I've said this a bunch of times, that Kant thinks that our conscience, our moral sense, is a not infallible, but pretty good guide to what uh, morality requires. Uh, um, even if we are also moved by inclinations that conflict with our moral sense. Um, but the point is that the foundation of uh, morality isn't found in our moral sense. That the justification for the moral law is not that we have a conscience. It's not that we explore what our intuitions say about morality in order to build up what uh, the categorical imperative says. The categorical imperative is categorical and therefore cannot be empirical and therefore has to be identified um, on the basis of um, an a priori investigation. Uh, 
Uh, once we've identified that, however, we see that it makes itself felt, empirically, felt in human beings through conscience. And that's this last one. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and start talking about the metaphysics and morals, but let me see if there are questions. Um, so, should I let me make this last point again? So conscience, what I'm calling conscience, is the empirical pull that we feel when we, imperfectly rational beings, beings in the world of sense, are affected by the categorical code. Universal. 
and that's going to get us toward the capital. So the positive dimension is what we need in order to preserve the sense of there being causation there. The negative sense is what we need in order to get the idea of not being determined by anything else. with 